One, two. In the back. Right. So it's the third one here? Yep.
go for it because it would be my only answer. <laughs> we are still trying to reach the successful uh, Yeah. Yeah, no, I had to I had to limit you from the board of the club. <laughs> I might still have to try and make that game work.
So just while the last few people are coming in, I know there has been a bit of confusion about rooms. So um, yeah, this is the one that matches that big slide on agency and ownership. Um, so I know there's been a few people kind of slipping back and forth. Um, there will at a couple of stages throughout this be a couple of bits where I'm going to get you to sort of like draw something. So if you don't have pen and paper, there is some paper and things in the middle of the, the aisles here for you to be able to grab. So yeah, we'll, I'll give a little bit of time for that when we actually, when we actually get to that part as well. Um, so yeah, I, when it came time to sort of put in presentations for ULEARN, I kind of thought, well, let's have a look at this word of agency and ownership. It's something that we've been looking at quite a bit over the last um, couple of years in my role. But yeah, you know, it's these really big, vague words that people were throwing, throwing around, and so that was kind of the idea behind this. And it seems like it's actually a pretty common thing that people are working on, because there's a lot of you here. Um, so I'm Steve Mouldy. I am currently the Specialised Learning Leader at Hobsonville Point Secondary School. Um, really fancy title that doesn't mean much to anyone who's not at our school. Basically, what it's around, it's a middle leadership type role. So for those of you in secondary school, it's kind of like that head of department type role. But we, there's four of us that look across all the curriculum areas. So it's about a, it's kind of a, a, a learning design across the curriculum type role. I'm also one of the core E fellows this year, which is an incredible experience. If you were one of the 97 or 98 people that applied for it this year, there was a massive. It's I think it's actually the largest amount of applications I've ever had. Um, looking forward, I'm really looking forward to tomorrow morning to see who gets the opportunity next year. It's an incredible program. Chance to actually go and investigate something that you're passionate about, that you really want, want to inquire into, but also the chance to work with a whole bunch of different educators across the whole year. We've become really tight. Tomorrow we're going to be wearing our team t-shirts for the day. Um, but also the chance to get out and see what's happening in other schools, which is such an incredible privilege. Um, I'm also very shouty and loud online, both on Twitter and on my blog, although that seems to have slowed down over the last couple of months, just as happens in Term 3. Um, the picture of me at the top and the picture at the bottom is how the rest of the e-fellows see me. I found this actually just a couple of days ago when I was starting to um, put the finishing touches on this presentation. And it's from a blog post by Justin Tart, but the sketch note is actually by Sylvia Duckworth. So I just wanted to actually put that name there. She does amazing sketches. Um, but this one is a really important thing. My research this year for eFellows was around looking at the student experience of design thinking, how that compares to the teacher experience. I've got a real passion for what the, you know, what the actual student experience and voices of things. Ever since my second year of teaching where I was part of a Te Kotaitanga program at Waitakere College, and the power of the student voice has stayed with me since then. So this, this blog post I read when it first came out is, is an older blog post, but it's a really interesting one, and I just like the different things that it sort of starts to go through. It's not the really big highfalutin ideas that students you know, actually want you to know. It's just that simple thing of actually getting to know them, which I think is, and so I was looking at this and went, oh, that's kind of cool, nice little image to kind of get us started on what we're looking at today. But I also wanted to start from the core video from earlier this year. Um, one of the 10 trends this year is around learner agency. So it's a really nice little link for, you know, for between being at a core event. It's actually filmed at the school that I'm at. It's one of my deputy principals who's actually speaking in it clear. Um, she will kill me for this, but I like to refer to it as her buzzword bingo video. Um, 
I'm absolutely of the opinion that if you tried watching this video as a drinking game, you'd be paralytic by the time the first minute is over. Um, so that's where I wanted to really start what today, what today was about. And don't worry, we're not watching the whole thing. The way that we've so that video, and that, and I mean the rest of the video is actually really good and goes into a whole bunch of the practices. But the start of that is the type of stuff that we hear a lot around agency. And, and ownership. It's all these quite big words, and it's about that, okay, but so what? What's the stuff that really underpins it? Um, so we've kind of had a look at that nice little sketch note of what it's about. That's what Core says it's about. And I sent out an email a few days ago to try to find out what it was that people here um, thought it was about. So thank you to, um, to the many of you that responded to that. That's going to... Ah, sorry. Um, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Um, Grant this morning, and I really hate slides like this normally with just multitudes of text, but this is actually a really lovely quote that really captures what it's about for me. Um, so I'm going to do that thing that actually most that I know um, of the 200 of you here, 190 of you are going to hate, and I'm actually going to read a slide to you. Um, he was frustrated that his juniors and seniors in high school struggled with owning their own learning, with pursuing learning purely because they wanted to. They kept asking him, what do you want me to do? These are bright, motivated kids. But I told him, since the age of five or six, they've been rewarded for doing what the teacher or parent asked, and then moving on to the next unit, paper, play date, after school activity, or grade level. Can we blame them? Should we be surprised or disappointed when at age 17 or 18, they are not suddenly ready, willing, eager, and prepared to grab the reins of learning on their own. And that really resonated to me, because coming from secondary school context, so often the kids come in, and for the first four years of secondary school, we're giving them everything. And you know, it's all the side of things. And then they get to year 13, we're like, oh, you're year 13, you're seniors, you can do all this now, off you go. And they all fall flat because we haven't actually built up the skills to do this. It's the type of thing, yes, there's actually a bit of a willingness to do this, but if we've spent 12, 13 years in schools stopping them from doing this or not allowing them to develop those skills, they're not going to be able to do that. It's the type of thing that actually we need to continually work and help them out to do this. And then I was really happy this morning, in this morning's keynote, when towards the end and he was putting up those what if questions, and sorry it's a bit blurry, it's a photo taken down off Twitter and all of that side of things, um, but the number two thing on those what if questions that he was talking about, the number two category was around student ownership of learning. You know, this is not just a New Zealand thing that's going on, this is a global thing that we're all trying to go, well, how, do we, how do we do this, what's this all about? But there's some... Um, great knowledge in this room already. I did have to take out learning and students, I think were the two words I took out because almost everyone had those in their answer multiple times and it just ended up quite massive. Um, so to actually get to see some of the stuff, this was what was all you know, coming through. So choice and voice and decisions and need, you know, we, along 
where we're at in here is really similar to all that stuff that we're seeing in the core videos and all that side of things. We know those actual kind of core things of what it's about, but today what I really want to start looking at is the you know, actual kind of practical strategies to underline it. What are the things that I'm using in my practice that we're using at Hobsonville Point that you know, we're trying to do to help our students out? Now I do have to put a little bit of a caveat at the start. This is my bias, right? These are my real core things that sit with me educationally. Um, I, many of you that I've connected with online over the last couple of years will know that I will rabbit on and on and on about curiosity. Um, some of you, I'm, some faces in here I remember from you learned last year in my presentation that was all about curiosity. Um, the, the fact that, to me, why curiosity is so important is that's what enables students to find their own learning paths. I know I'm someone that doesn't like the whole staff professional development thing when it's a whole, right, now we're all going to sit down and we're all going to learn about this thing together. Well, that's exactly what we do to, our, do to our kids every day in most schools across New Zealand. But creativity is also really important. And it took me a little while to work out, like, what is it? What is it actually about this creativity thing that really sparks with me? Um, I go back a couple of years ago, and I was, and I was really taken by these ideas of guerrilla geography. I come from a geography, social studies, that's my area. And guerrilla geography is the stuff that came out of the UK that was all about people kind of playing with landscapes and look, looking at things from different perspectives. And to, you know, it was this really creative, fun way to totally shift what we were looking at in terms of geography. And then I kind of came across design thinking, and there were like all these different things. And I was like, well, what is it that's actually about this? So it empowers them to create change. Why is that important? I actually have quite a core part of me that is based upon this social justice perspective of education. That, you know, I really want kids to be able to go out of my classroom and go and make change in the world around them. Oh, that really annoys me. You know, to me, I want my kids to be citizens now. And that's a, so, you know, this curiosity and creativity, yep, there are a lot of fun and they're engaging, but there's a purpose to it, and that's where my purpose comes from. Two strategies, so yeah, that's kind of the, the waffly part at the start. Now we can actually start getting into you know, some actual practical strategy stuff. The stuff for me, um, with curiosity, wonder walls are something that I use all the time. I love to capture the questions that are coming up for students at the time. Not, hey, actually, can you hold on to that question for um, one and a half weeks, and then we'll get to it then. I like to see what's coming up then. Um, you know, where this is a classroom that I am teaching in at the moment that has nice big glass windows, so really easy to kind of chuck the pens out and go, hey, that stuff that you're thinking about right now, just go and write it. Up on that wall. It's good for them to be able to share it. It's nice for me to be able to see where their minds are going. But it's also good for the other students in the class to see what's coming up for others. Some of the um, kids that are less confident with sharing that stuff can look up and actually go, hey, there's four or five other questions that have kind of been sitting in my head at the moment. Maybe it is OK for me to take that risk and put my idea up there. Um, windows, you know, lovely, but not every classroom has masses of big windows. Um, butcher's paper that's just stuck up on the wall and then give them some post-its and they can go and chuck you know, the questions on post-its. Post-its also really good for that idea. I feel like I should be sponsored by 3M. Um, for the fact that you can color code for different types of questions. This is the questions I'm having about the stuff that I just don't understand. These are the questions I've got about, oh, is it possible for us to investigate this stuff? You know, like, so you can actually kind of start color coding that bit those bits, and then actually go, all right, any of you that had any of those blue questions up there, now's the, now's the time to go and grab that, and let's have a look through those bits. Or I can go up and have a look at you know, the orange or the green or whatever it is for that category and go, OK, so what's the bits that the kids just don't understand? Because just because we've been going over in class doesn't mean they're getting it. 
right? And so being able to go through and actually see what's the thing sitting there that they just totally didn't get. And you can see it really quickly with that one. If you've set up a color with the class that this is the stuff you don't understand, you're working away with some kids here. You know, and so, so much of our time is spent working one-on-one -on -one or one with a, with a small group of kids. And you look up on the wall, and all of a sudden there's five, six, seven more questions in that I don't understand color. Oh, okay, stop. Here's a little bit of a teachable, you know, a moment where we need some direct teaching to go on. Um, curiosity tables, um, that little picture I do have to say is not mine. Um, it's for those of you on Twitter, hey Millie or Amanda Signal that you might um, know through other circuits. That was actually in a workshop last year at, at ULEARN um, where we were working together with Tom Barrett on some stuff. And it was an idea that she came up with for how she was going to really encourage more curiosity from the students in her class. That she, that she was going to have these curiosity tables so that whatever that topic was or that issue was that they were investigating at that time, that she would provide some things that linked to it, but actually the students could also bring in some objects that linked, that linked into that thing so that others could have a look and have a little bit of a, a play with it and a wonder and, you know, and help to spark a little bit more things. You know, sometimes learning, just that normal learning about stuff, okay, might, prov might provoke a few more thoughts or questions, but actually getting to pick stuff up and hold it and play with it, we all know how, you know, how engaging that type of stuff can be as well. So I guess I've kind of been leading to this with the wonder walls. Questioning is, from my perspective, the number one thing that we can help our students develop in terms of giving them ownership over their learning. If they can't generate their own you know, decent learning questions, then they're not going to be able to really grab, grab hold of their, own, of their own learning. That's a really big sign of curiosity is when the questions start coming up. Um, I have got a whole bunch of different ways that I work with my students around, around questioning, so what I'm going to share today is a couple of those, those different things. And one of them is quite a long, drawn-out process, but you can take parts of it to use, to use separately. Um, but actually, the images, some of the images in this are from stuff that's happened just all of a couple of weeks ago in class as we're going through a bit longer um, question development process. Um, question storming. Now, teachers, we're all great at having these, you know, oh, we need to do some stuff in groups, we need to get some ideas around this, and so we'll have these brainstorms or whatever phrase it is that you want to use for that type of idea, but question storms are just as powerful. And in fact, what I've found and what I've read online and seen around the side of things, Really basic things. I last year um, during the Football World Cup, the very first match of the Football World Cup had um, it was Brazil having a having a home game, and so the papers the next day had this amazing image of all like hundreds of people walking in in their Brazil jerseys into the stadium, and they were having to kind of slightly diverge around a um, a big skip bin. Inside the skip bin was a lady holding a baby in amongst all the rubbish. And I put that image down in front of my students the next day. And we started question storming. And all the first questions, <laughs> why is the lady in the bin? You know, um, by the time that we got to about question number sort of 35, 40, we were starting to get questions ar around questioning the judgment of of allowing Brazil to host a World Cup if it has so many homeless people. Um, we then got to the, to the point of you know, like how much of the profits actually go to this type of place. And then we even got to the great, you know, the really great questions around, well, actually, should that be part of it? You know, like in you know, some of those real, really strong, controversial debates around, around some of that stuff. And it took until sort of around the 30th question to start to get to those deeper things. And that's really borne out by a lot of what I've seen 
um, online, but also through the many different times that I've done the strategy. Now, this one here was, um, I'm teaching a cross-curricular course with a science teacher and myself, and we've been looking at artificial intelligence. So the science part of it has been looking at the way that um, circuits and all that side of things is made, and the social sciences side of it has been around sustainability. And so I've taken a really social and economic side of it, and we've been looking at artificial intelligence, and what this was the start of was the kids had come up with a whole bunch of different aspects of artificial intelligence that would need to be covered if New Zealand had a national policy on artificial intelligence. So like we did around um, genetically modified stuff a few years ago, we used that you know, as, as an example, and we started looking at it. And they had looked at all these different aspects they'd created, I think it was 14 different aspects, and the students gave us all three that they were interested in working in, so we allocated them out into the groups and things. And the first thing that they did in their group was sit down with a big sheet of paper, and they had to come up with 50 questions that they had around things. So this was from the group that were looking at medical use of artificial intelligence. And so they were not allowed to move on to the next stage until they had 50 questions. Now, for some of those groups, they got there in around sort of 40, uh, might be a bit harsh, around 25 minutes was the first group. They worked really quite quickly and they were able to generate lots of questions. For some of the groups, it took them the whole 90 minute block to be able to generate those 50 questions. And so that gives you that idea of some of those, you know, some students and even if we look at us, are really great at generating lots of questions quite quickly around things. It's, you know, it's a skill that you need to develop. For some, they really struggle. And so what I, um, oh, yeah, actually, I'll get to it shortly to show you um, some of the things that we've, that we've built in place to help scaffold some of those other people. But generating the 50 questions, okay, so we've got lots of questions. So what, you've got to do something, you can't then go and investigate 50 questions, right? So then you've got to start refining it down. So what they had to do at this point was refine it down to the eight best questions. So you know, they've done all the generating, and that generation stage is not a judgment stage. I really talk about the fact that you know, there's no such thing as a stupid question. You know, in fact, the worst questions, and same if it's a brainstorm type idea, the worst idea can sometimes stem some better ones. And so in, in a generation phase, just get it all down there because we'll refine it later. We'll, we'll put on those critical judgy hats, you know, soon. And so we get to this point and we go, okay, so what's the eight best questions you've got there? And so they're all going through and they're arguing. And, you know, this is where it's really great in a, you know, where they're working collaboratively because you get the different perspectives on things and, and they gain having those bit more intense discussions. So we get it down to eight questions. And at that stage I say, excellent, you've got eight questions. Now, if it's an open question, make it closed. And if it's a closed question, make it open. And so they were getting really excited. Awesome, we had 50, now we're down to eight, and oh man, we're back up to 16 questions again. But what it's doing is it's teaching them the power of changing just one or two words and the impact that that has and what the question can do. And so, you know, I mean, we love to talk about the ungoogleable question or that open question, but actually sometimes it's really powerful to be able to open, you know, to ask quite a closed question as well, and just knowing the difference of how to construct one or two of those. And at that point, some students, once again, you know, some of the groups might have you know, a couple of students in it that are really good at this, and you can hear these great conversations amongst the students as they're teaching the others how to do it. Some groups might not have anyone in that group that's really good at that, and so that's where you end up sitting down and, and helping, you know, talking through. So what's an open question? What's a closed question? And, you know, and you work through that. Um, and then once I've got that 16, I say, awesome, you've got it up to 16, now you need to choose four questions that your group's going to go off and, and investigate. And um, 
and invariably they do choose the more open ones, you know, the, you know, the bit juicier topics, but sometimes there will be a closed one in there because they need to find out that specific information to help them with the others, and that's fine. But all of this is still really challenging for some students. And so having some scaffolds is really important. So those big blank sheets for them to write all the questions down, yep, they were excellent, it was great, they you know, were able to do that, but actually there was a whole bunch of these sheets sitting, sitting at a table was, hey, if you're struggling to generate those questions, come and grab a grid. And some of them just like having the grid beside them, some of them will actually write the questions in the grid. And in fact, other teachers at Hobsable Point will actually, basically this is their starting point. They use the grid and they get, right, on this topic or on this issue or whatever it is that we're looking at today, you're going to sit here and you're going to actually fill out the grid with questions. So you're going to have a question that is a, a what is. And so I mean, this here, it's not, you know, yes, this is the one that we're using at Hobsable Point, but this is not something we've created. It's come from multiple places and been reworked. And, um, and in fact, Last year, um, Cindy Wynn from our school was sharing this question grid, but it, um, it didn't have the should part in it at that stage. And I said, look, from a social, from a social sciences perspective, that should is a really powerful you know, word in a question. That's where the kind of argument and debate and discussion and different perspective stuff comes in. And so that's the, you know, um, this is sort of where it's at now. And so just, you know, the five W's and an H type thing, you know, that we've seen in schools for years and years and years is great. But actually the second word is just as powerful in a question. And so having a grid like this can really help kids. Because if they can fill out one in each box there, well, they've got 42 questions sitting there about their, their topic. You know, that's a, that's a really awesome starting point. Um, and so this is a really useful mechanism that we have found really helps our students. Okay, enough of me talking at you for a little bit. This is a bit where you're going to need something to write on, whether it's your device, whether it's pen and paper, um, whatever. If you if you're sitting there relaxing without anything, or if you just actually feel, feel like you know, putting a device aside and writing on some paper, there is some paper in the middle and at the front here. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to have five minutes to generate as many questions as you can about that image. Now, this is an image taken, I'll give you a little bit of context. Um, a wonderful, wonderful early childhood centre based at Auckland Hospital called Kids Domain. It's one of the places that we visited this year as eFellows. Um, it's a picture taken there. That's about all the context I'm going to give you right now. Five minutes, which means that we will finish at 32 minutes and 50, so go! <laughs> as many questions as you can. Remember, no silly or bad question.
people like me who think that now ought to be the end. Because I guess we've enjoyed this for so long. So, obviously, at this point, if this was, you know, as part of a, a class that you're taking, you've done this little bit, this is where you then start to think, okay, so what are the better questions in here? And you get different groups to share their questions and, and all that side of things, do all those, you know, kind of normal strategies. But it's just a, a chance to have a little bit of a taste of that idea. What I find with students when we're doing... Um, you know, question storms, or if we're doing little 10 minute ideation sessions or brainstorms and things like that, is especially if it's a longer time, like a 10 or 15 minute time, is having some little prompts to throw out really helps. So, you know, things like what's the silliest question you can come up with to do with this? You know, and, and everyone kind of laughs and they throw a couple in, but sometimes those really silly questions actually all of a sudden throw a little bit of a different light on it and different sides of it so that you can start to develop that a little bit further. Now, just a bit more context now that you've had that initial first look at that. Um, I couldn't actually get a photo further back of the whole display because there were too many kids in there and it's the type of thing that, you know, where I don't know the permissions and, and all that side of things um, of sharing their images. But this cups. To the wall and like that type of type of area within this early childhood center and basically all they had done was stuck a whole one day they had some plastic cups and a couple of the kids were playing and stacking them up and so the next day they put more of the cups out there and some of the kids were playing with them and went and grabbed some bits from other areas and started to build it up and now in this, in this area, and it's in the um, area that they have for their kind of three and a half to five year olds, and within this area of this early childhood centre, they've got cups and they've got just blocks of, blocks of wood and they've got animals and they've got all kinds of different bits in there. And it's just left to go as it, as it happens. Um, they've used that to form the basis of some like early math stuff that they're, that they're doing with the students. Um, they go out, because they're based in the hospital, they go out for walks around the hospital grounds and come back and up on that, so you see the bottom of the white wall there, on the white wall was a projector playing the video they took as they walked around the, the hospital. And so there were some boys sitting there actually building one of the buildings that they had seen. Um, and they've got music playing, and there's kind of all these different prompts, and it's just left, and it's been going for two years, this area. So to develop, it's the most incredible, 
um, you know, experience to actually see it in action. Um, obviously, if we're talking about questioning, you know, inquiry is a, is a really obvious part in here. Um, so many different inquiry models. Um, that's not so much our inquiry model, it's what we call our learning design model. It's kind of the, the each colored hexagon is like a different type of thinking, a different phase of learning that's going on, and the little words within it are kind of the types of things. So um, if you're generating things at the bottom there, you know, you might generate by expressing, you might generate by communicating, by creating, by ideating, by designing, and so on. Um, there's one word in that learning design model that does not come from the New Zealand curriculum, and that's ideate. And, but it was something that we thought was actually worth putting in there because it's come out of design and come out of technology more recently than really when the curriculum was written. Um, but we had really big arguments about whether it was going to be allowed in there. And we've actually got another layer outside of that of the types of contexts that it might be used in. Um, and there's one word in all of those context levels that doesn't come out of the New Zealand curriculum as well, and that was to redraft. So under refining, we had you know, um, to refine by adapting your thing to feedback and, redra you know, and redrafting. Well, actually, redrafting is a really important part of, of learning to write better, and that was something that um, actually we, we really felt should be in there. But... Inquiry, I don't know, I'm probably a bit harsh on social studies and social studies teachers because it's just, you know, we're of social, social studies. We look at inquiry as, okay, it's a research project time. Separate inquiry away from just research at some st stage. Um, you know, I can inquire into something really quickly and, and rapidly by having to play around with something. I'm inquiring to it. You know, it's much more linked up with curiosity to me than with just research. You know, research is a really formalized, structured type of inquiry, but it's a type of inquiry. It's not all inquiry. Um, to me, inquiry also means that there's some type of action going on with it, you know, which isn't necessarily with research. And to me, these inquiry skills, like questioning and like researching and those types of things, you know, many, many, many New Zealand schools do this really well, and it's a great, great step to actually developing agency and ownership of learning with the students if we actually talk with our students about what it is that they're learning throughout that, and not just the context, not just the that they've gone about finding that out, yeah, you know, really having those discussions and conversations with the students so that they actually gain their own understanding of how to inquire. That's the things that's going to help them to own their learning in your classroom now, but also over the rest of their career in schools and once they've left school, or even now outside of school. This is a little bit of an idea that I've been playing around with in my head when I get the time <laughs> at, the, at the moment. And it's really kind of sitting in there for me and it's, it's really kind of unformed. So if I get a little bit vague as we go through some of this, that's why. But, you know, and yes, it comes out of inquiry, but it's also just about that whole kind of curriculum design and the design of the ways that we're going about things in our class. And I see this real continuum from one side of being really teacher controlled. And the first step to actually giving students some agency, some ownership over that, is to actually start to give them some choices within that. And I think that's something that doing quite well over, over the years and then you know, the types of people that, 
that make it here to you learn start to kind of take it on to that next step you know in terms of you know and within those choices where we start to get a bit of student voice but I also want to start considering what it might look like if we actually move beyond just that into kind of the realms of actually considering our students co-designers of learning um, that you know, it's not just us teachers that are designing the learning experiences for the students, that actually students are a real part of that partnership as well. So I don't really need to spend too much time on teacher controlled. We know what that is about, right? The teachers sit there, they have their curriculum, and they work out this is what we're doing, and this is the ways that we're going about that. Um, and whether that's done year to year or whether it's going awesome, I'm in, I'm in term two, go to my shelf and grab out that Antarctica unit again. Um, you know, but it's, it's that idea of actually the teacher's the one making those decisions and here's the stuff that you're going to be learning. So the first step of moving past that and actually starting to relinquish a little bit of control, you know, stepping into possibly into a little bit of discomfort land of um, handing over some of that ownership is to go, all right, we're going to be studying deserts and you have the choice of Antarctica or the Sahara or the Kalahari and you know, starting to hand over some of those choices, whether it's of that topic. But this also actually leads into some of the UDL type stuff as well, you know, that takes you know, much further steps. So as well as the choice of topic or it might be within this one topic, here's the different, once we've done that main base stuff, you've got a choice of which part of it you want to do. So like with the AI earlier, um, where it was like, okay, you know, here's the different aspects we can investigate. Oh, I'm really interested in the medical AI. I'm going to go and look at that, while others want to look at military AI, you know, killer robots. Who doesn't want to spend a couple of weeks investigating that? Um, you know, that you've got those different choices of kind of sub-context, but also maybe choices about... work with a group of people on this I'm really feeling I want to just do this on my own yeah and at times you've got to also challenge some of those choices you know help them to make those you know to you know to think about why they're making those choices hang on actually the last four things we've done you've made a video and uploaded it to YouTube okay that's great but there's other ways of communicating information how about we also work on those skills so choice is a really great aspect to start to give over a little bit of ownership. And, and students love that. They love being able to go, awesome, I get a little bit of choice here. I'm getting a little bit of say in this. Great. Um, but in many cases, you know, it's still the teachers, for the most part, coming up with what those choices are. Um, And yeah, kind of my feelings around that, look, I've been a really big advocate of choice for years. It's been a big part of the way, the way that I've operated in my classroom. But my feeling about it at the moment is that it's kind of like this. You know, it's sugarcoating that control. I've still got the control, but here's a little bit of nice fancy sugar on top to make you feel good about the fact that I've got that control. Um, Actually, back at Kids Domain, I heard it described a bit different way of um, slipping the vegetables into the ice cream. Yeah, which was another really good thing. But I just cannot find any decent images to go with that, so I go with the sugar coating. Um, I may just have to actually create some ice cream with veggies in it so that I can you know, kind of use that line a bit more. Um, but yeah, it's, it's that idea of... You know, and it's actually quite important because we need to know they're getting that base information. There's some really good reasons behind why we're creating those choices for them. That we need to know they're getting that base understanding, those base skills that they need to progress. But if we're thinking about actually developing students' ownership of learning and you know, developing their ability to do that side of things, well, actually, we need to also start to move beyond just giving those choices. And so the obvious next step of that is around student voice. Um, this is one from last year, 
and basically we were just getting some voice around what students liked about their modules. So that's why module and liked and really uh, <laughs> are um, quite big there. But you can also see we've got lots of awesome science geeks in our school. Um, And for the most part, like if I think back five or ten years ago in my teaching practice, I was awesome at getting student voice in those first couple of weeks of December. Yeah, what did you enjoy this year? Okay, awesome stuff. You know, and, uh, you know, and, and you put that whole thing of it, hey, can we get some voice back on this? And then you know, it's really going to help me to shape up the stuff for what happens next year for you know, the next lot of kids I teach. And the kids are suddenly going, awesome, so my idea is going to help someone else. Um, now, we've got to get that a little bit earlier. And it can be not just around, what do I like about this? But actually starting to get their ideas of what it is that they you know, kind of want to, want to investigate, what they feel they need to learn about. So at Hobsonville Point, we talk about our foundation years program, our years 9 and 10 program. And when we had that amazing luxury of time that everyone was able to kind of voice in unison this morning, um, yeah, we had six months, well, some of us at the school had six months before students arrived. And the team that I'm in, the specialised learning thing, um, we tore apart the curriculum in a tiny little room into thousands of post-its. Um, which one of the outcomes was that learning design model that was you know, kind of how learning should occur, but we also looked at what the learning should be about. And we looked at what are the concepts this is talking about, what are the contexts, what are the um, skills. And we, when we did that, we found out there were really great connections amongst the concepts, that there's some really common concepts amongst the different learning areas. And so what we did was we created a foundation years program based upon the eight concepts that we saw had the strongest connection across the learning areas. And, you know, eight, excellent, because then we can look at eight terms of, you know, the first um, two years at school. And I mean, for the first one, obviously, we had no students there, so we couldn't really get much voice to help create the courses that we were going to offer with that. But then coming towards the end of term, or sort of you know, middle of term one, and we're starting to think, okay, okay we're underway, we're teaching this term. Um, we need to make up, you know, we need to start thinking about what are the courses that we're going to be teaching in term two. And it's all on this concept, I'm trying to think what it was in term two last year, but you know, say one of, the, um, one of the concepts is relationships, so you know, if, if we look at relationships, what's the things that, that we want to teach? And so in learning areas, we sat down and we looked at you know, our curriculum and what are the things under this, and um, you know, kind of thought, well, there's some ideas. And then our team, our specialised learning team, actually sat down and with a bunch of students and they came up with what they would like to learn about under that concept. And so then when we came to the point of starting to plan for our Term 2 courses, the teachers sat down with the learning area stuff and with the student voice of what they wanted to learn about, and that's where the courses came from. And then those courses go out to the students, and they all start to choose what it is that they're going to, um, you know, what it is that they wanted to do. And that's down to the point of uh, last year it was every term, now we do it in kind of semesters of actually I want to take my maths in that combo with the PE teacher there where they're looking at like biomechanics and all that type of stuff. Um, and they, so they make all those choices and that personalised choice, but they're also getting the um, breadth across, across it. Um, and so their voice goes directly into what we then create. Now that's exactly where that artificial intelligence module 
came from. That wasn't just Danielle and I going, cool, let's teach. I know how we can do this. We could do it around artificial intelligence. So it, last term was innovation, and next term is transformation as our concepts. And a whole bunch of kids under innovation wanted to look at what, uh, you know, find out a bit more about AI. And we kind of looked at it and went, well, actually, I can make that work with sustainability. And Danielle, with her science hat on, went, well, that's totally part of it. You know, that's a great context to hook kid, kids into, you know, electricity and circuits and all that side of things. You know, why bother getting them to sit there and go, OK, and today we're going to learn how to draw a circuit diagram. You know, um, so we were actually able to do a whole bunch of stuff on AI, get them really hooked into this that came from them and then start to kind of build upon that with our, you know, with our knowledge and with, out, and with lots of outside help of people coming in. Um, so we're really able to use their voice as a really strong part of that. Now, another thing that really combines that choice and voice aspect of it and starts to head towards the co-design um, is a really big passion of mine using of design thinking. But you know, design thinking is a process, okay, but the part of it that's really important in terms of the student voice part of it is the fact that design thinking as an you know, as a type of inquiry, as a human-centered empathy you know, type thing, it's actually that the kids start off by having to find the problem themselves first. Um, so it's not so much of, of that inquiry where it's basically it's like giving them a jigsaw puzzle and they put that piece of information together. Um, Problem finding is looking at it and looking at it, something and getting to, you know, spending a lot of time immersing, finding out information, um, investigating, surveying, observing, all those types of things and going, actually, you know what? I think this is the core thing at play within this broader issue. So examples of this under the concept of place, I was working with a food tech teacher um, and we were looking, Hobsonville Point, for those of you that don't know, is a really new development, and it's rapidly, rapidly growing. And so we went out and we said, well, let's go have a look in our community at what's going on. You know, we're under this concept of place. Let's see what the community needs are in terms of you know, social studies and in terms of actually accessing food. Now, as a new development, well, until about three weeks ago, there was no such thing as a supermarket. There was um, one four square and one cafe, and the four square, you know, wasn't that was kind of in Hobsonville, not in Hobsonville Point. It was kind of that little bit further up the road. Um, and we walked around, and all of a sudden, the kids realised these houses are a bit different than most New Zealand houses. It's not kind of the, um, you know, the nice big backyards and all this type of thing. It's really townhouse and really kind of, you know, um, tiny backyards. And we were trying to say, well. So if there was some type of big disaster, how are people going to get food here? And, but as we walked around, we stopped and we pointed out a couple of different bits, you know, like great timing for it, you know, when there's major construction going on and you go down to the, to the nice little wetlands area and you see all the stuff being washed in by the rain because of all the construction, going, oh, well, it used to be quite nice to go floundering there. It's probably not at the moment. Um, and talking about some of those aspects around the community, and then we got back to the classroom, and the students all just broke off and started thinking about what's the stuff that we saw that was really interesting there? What's the things that we see as being an issue that we need to investigate a bit further? And so rather than us saying, <coughs> right, we want you to have a look and to design a way for people to um, grow food in their own backyards, we went out and we said, right, what's the problems in our community? What's the, you know, what's the future, the problems that we're going to face in the future here? So we had some kids that decided, actually, there's nowhere for kids to play. You know, and, and some of them focus on families with young kids, and they were thinking of their big backyards with their big tree huts and all this type of thing. And so that group actually ended up 
after they'd found that problem, going on and developing a um, playhouse that was made of fabric and then some timber outplays that you could pull out, play in, and then at the end of the time push it back up against the fence again. Um, we had a group of, of um, boys that were really keen to have a, a decent rec community centre in the area that you know, wasn't part of the community plans. And so they sat down and on Minecraft designed this most amazing rec centre with German food. So they were, you know, they were the ones that really went and investigated what's the problem here. Now that's something that even if you're not using a design thinking process, that you can build into any type of inquiry. But you can only do that if you're really sure of your curriculum areas and if you're taking it, for me, the real key in that is taking it to that concept and skill level. What's the core thing that I need them to develop? And if we frame it, what's the thing within that? Because then you've got the student voice aspect of it, but you've also got that really strong curriculum side of it that, yes, I know they're developing the things that they're going to need in future. Um, I, last holidays, was at a conference at AUT that was designed for social innovation. So there was about three teachers in the room and there was a few lecturers and then there's a whole bunch of people from like um, social enterprise areas, um, life hack, places, places like that, um, lots of people from health. And one of the people speaking there was talking about within health and within mental, mental health provision that they had to move from capturing voice to co-designing. And since then, what I've seen happen with an Auckland District Health Board is if you've walked into any of their hospitals lately, they've got all these massive um, places set up to actually find out what's going on, like what's your experience when you've been in within this area. And some of those things are aimed specifically at, you know, like within this unit, um, or it might just be more generally for the hospital. And they're using that to, first of all, capture some of that voice, but then work with people in terms of using that as part of it. And I sat there and I just went, man, that resonates with me for education. We are excellent at capturing voice, but actually using, it, using that voice and us sitting down working with students to really design what's going to happen from here is something that I feel we're not quite there yet with. Um, and I feel we've taken those steps at Hobbsville Point through some of the stuff that I've talked about before, but we definitely couldn't have, couldn't have done it without breaking it down into those core concepts first. So this is um, when we first started breaking things down into kind of concepts and skills and contexts and the different colours of different learning areas and, and that was just from those essence pages at that stage. And then we started heading into the AOs and it all kind of exploded bigger. Um, but we started with essence pages because, after all, that's the stuff that's compulsory in the New Zealand curriculum document. Um, so having that really great understanding of what your curriculum is about is the first step to being able to co-design. So if you're going in knowing your areas really well or what it is that you most need to develop, and I'm not talking about all of that stuff that you go about teaching that core stuff. If you break it down to that core bit, that's what enables us to actually sit down and really fairly, equitably co-design with the students. Now, first times you do it, you're really still focused on your area you know, or, or on like what you're trying to bring to the table. And I found this in designing with someone from another subject area, but all, you know, also particularly when you start to get with students, because there is you know, that little bit of the control or kind of hierarchical factor that you're the teacher and they're the student. 
And so that aspect is still there the first times you sit down at the table. For you, it's also really there for the students. They're used to being able to have their little say, they're not so used to that say really being a big part of what happens. And so, it, you know, you've got to build up trust. Like you do working in any team, you've got to build up the trust in being able to do that. And that builds up by you following through on some of that stuff that you agree on when, you, when you're working with them. Now, some of the stuff that comes up might be in totally other and really not kind of able to follow through on. But man, I've had plenty of those totally there was no way it was going to be able to follow through on. Um, but yeah, to me, I really passionately feel that the key aspect to being able to sit down with students is to break it down to the core thing. Can you sit down and for the stuff that you're teaching, you know, for one class or on one type of thing next term, break it down into on a post-it. This is what my kids need to develop next term. If you can get it onto a post-it, then you've got the core essence of what it is that they need to develop. I guess it's the same thing of trying to you know, break it all down in, into one tweet. You know, of this is it. If you can get it down to that core stuff, then you can start going, okay, cool, how can I work in on that? So you sit down and the students come up with this direction is nah, 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 and then all of a sudden you go, oh, hang on, actually, you know, a year might not fit with how I thought that might flow out, but actually now we can start that conversation. And it is a dialogue, a conversation, it's, you know, that's the starting point, point of this, and being open to looking at people from those other perspectives. Um, the whole thing of... Um, at the end of Grant's talk this morning about being comfortable with that discomfort, there is some elements to that in starting, in starting to do this. Now, apologies for the language, and it's not that clear, but Punk Learning by Tate Coles out of the UK, this quote is absolutely gold. Um, there's a, a bunch of people who, when you start to do this type of stuff, that sit there and they look at you and they go, oh, that's just easy. You're taking the easy way out. You're just letting the students do their own thing. No, if we're co-designing, we're really bringing our stuff to the table with them. We've got to know our stuff far better. So handing over ownership, handing over ownership to your students is not the same thing as just letting them do whatever they want. This is hardcore punk learning, not fucking freeform jazz. Okay, this, you know, and that's what it's about. This is not just saying, okay, cool. What's your question that you know, is kind of sitting in your head at the moment? Choice, go for it. And then sitting back and going, awesome, I get to drink coffee and read what's online. And you, know, you work really hard when this stuff is going on, but it's a different type of work. Rather than spending hours and hours and hours at night prepping all of these worksheets and all of this stuff there, you end up sprinting around the classroom for hours in your day. Um, there's days where I think, man, I wish I'd had a pedometer on today. And um, you know, a good friend of mine always does step timber. We, you know, you've got to take 10,000 steps every day in September. And I just laugh. I, took, I actually borrowed their, um, their pedometer one day, wore it, and I'd passed the 10,000 by about 11 o'clock in the morning. Now, yeah, we, you know... Um, that day might have been a bit different than some other days, but actually, I, I mean, you'll see, I don't like to stay still. I move back and forth even when I'm just standing here talking. But you know, it's that case of you're yeah, working with this student, then you're over here with this one, then you're over here working, working with these guys, and then you're back up here. OD policies or good access online, you know, that stuff underpins us. But it's not about, you know, it's not about that tech, but the tech enables us to do this way, way better than we could if we were relying on those 15 books in the corner. Um, you know, or what the library has managed to source for you, and especially now that the National Library Book Service is gone. Um,
Now, coming back to something that I mentioned right back towards the start around my core stuff that I really am keen on. If we're talking about agency, if we're talking about agentic, then what we're talking about right, is, you know, also has those real links with citizenship. Now, I'm not teaching citizens of the future. They will be citizens in the future, but they're citizens now. One of the most incredible blog posts that I read last year was by a 15-year-old girl from a school um, called Mount Vernon in Atlanta in the States. And her whole, this blog post was about her hatred for the question of what do you want to do when you grow up? So like, well, forget about that. What is it that I want to do now? And she was actually a student that I um, interviewed for my eFellows research this year. And she's someone who's using design thinking a lot. They have this program there where instead of like an honors program like most American high schools use, um, they have an innovation diploma. And rather than just being open to the top academic kids in their final year of school, anyone in the high school is able to apply and they go through you know, a really of kids in this program. And they undertake design thinking projects out in the community with, you know, like the um, Georgian State Health Department and kind of, kind of things like that. And she's saying, well, if in this one aspect of my schooling, I can go out and have that much impact on the world, why am I doing stuff over here that I just feel is utterly meaningless? And... You know, that really resonates with my perspective on education. It resonates really strongly with the ways that we're doing things at Hobsonville Point, or at least trying to, you know, not all the time. We, you know, we're, not, we're not Finland, you know, we're not this perfect <laughs> utopia. Um, <clears throat> so just two things, um, two, you know, quite nice examples of the type of ways that kids can take action immediately and help to do things. Um, Sharing our school site right in the middle of our school is, um, is a satellite of Arohanui Special School. And um, at the start, it was kind of like this satellite of Arohanui was, was sitting at our school, but not really part of our school. And it took us a little while to work out how we could actually work a bit better together. And so last term, um, Sally Hart, wonderful, wonderful PE teacher at our school, um, spoke to, well, said before last term, you know, so that it could happen last term, spoke to the staff at Aroha Nui, and some of our Year 9 and 10 students, we only have Year 9 and 10 at the stage, um, actually ran the PE program for Aroha Nui. So this wasn't the teachers, this was the kids that ran the Aroha Nui PE program for them. Now these are kids with all kinds of disabilities. So our kids had to get to know them first, and they had to then go and design different types of activities that these kids you know, would be able to undertake, and they ran it. Now the really cool thing about this, these kids actually, you know, some of the kids in this class are the types of kids and I can see you know, there's a couple of pictures of a, a couple of girls in there that have always absolutely hated PE. You know, oh, I don't want to want to get out there and do all the types of this. But now they're doing it with a purpose, with a mean, you know, with meaning. So they have to go through and they have to run the activities and they have to do it themselves and test it out on other students in their class, and then they're ready to go and run this with um, with Aroha Nui. Um, but the other also really cool side benefit of this, you know, that happens when you take social action, it's not, you know, you can't just enter this one part of society and just have an impact on this one part, there's always little other ripples that occur, is that all of a sudden, a couple of the students in Aroha Nui made connections on things that they were really interested in and passionate about with kids from Hobsonville Point. And so now, you're seeing far more of the, the, hey, actually, you want to go hang out after school. 
you know, we're seeing those real types of impacts. Um, Ave would blush madly if she knew that I was talking about one of our one of um, the year ten girls at you know at Hobbsville Point that has made a really strong connection and the most lovely connection with one of the Aroha Nui girls. I've found out a couple of kind of common connections, distant relatives, and you know and and, and really similar interests, and so they catch up quite regularly now. You know, so wonderful things like that, but then also um, in a class of Mine last term where, so the social studies angle of sustainability rather than the AI stuff that I was doing. And this one, once again, I was working with a good mate of mine, Pete, that's a food tech teacher. And um, we were looking at sustainable food practices. And so we started off looking at things, um, looking at some of those docos like food, to kind of provoke a bit of stuff out of the students. And... Um, one group of girls really latched on to the stuff from That Sugar film. And so they created That Sugar Project. And they created Instagram accounts and Facebook and Twitter. Um, were super, super excited the day that That Sugar film actually followed them and started sharing their stuff. And as, so they, their whole thing was, we just want to raise awareness of what sugar is doing and we want to help people to actually just stop and think a bit more about how much sugar they're having. And so they're in, you know, they started off with that whole, um, you know, with a fact about sugar, and then if this, if this gets shared a thousand times, we'll crack an egg over our head. You know, like those kind of little Facebook viral type things. Um, and of course, it kind of didn't really go anywhere. So they thought, well, we've got to go about this a little bit different way if we actually want to have an impact here. And so they started creating weekly challenges that went out on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. And all of a sudden, they started to get a little bit of, bit of momentum going. Now, they're nowhere there yet. It's only you know, in those starting things. But actually, they're going to continue this on next term, because next term, when we talk about transformation, and we're looking at what are the things that really help to transform a society, they're going to get the chance to continue on with this project and really work it, work it that, much, that much further. So, Yes, but they're also having an impact now on people's lives. Now, this was, you know, a small thing. Um, and in fact, you know, there were other great examples of actions that people took, but this was a nice pretty picture to be able to put on. <laughs> um, feedback. Um, Sarah Martin will smile at me here as I put a Hattie quote. Um, so I'm actually not a massive fan of all of the you know, Hattie effect sizes and things, I can say that. Um, but when stuff comes through saying that the quality of feedback may have more impact on student achievement than any other factor, I'm going to work on that. And particularly as we start to work kids more towards working collaborative group situations. If we don't develop students' abilities to give each other quality feedback, then we're going to lose this. So it's really important to do that. So I'm going to share with you two, two things that I use with, um, with students. Number one, hackers. Now I got this um, last year off um, Tom Barrett and Hamish Curry when I was at Google Teacher Academy in Sydney. And so we all know the helpful kind specific. Well, that's great. But actually, if you add two other bits in there and they kind of work against each other a little bit of ambitious and realistic, all of a sudden we add a bit of grunt, a bit of depth to this. Now this, you know, it's not Tom's thing. He didn't make this up. He's just who I got it from. It's, it started off with a book by Ron Berger, An Ethic of Excellence, and it was adapted and added to a, to a little bit by others, and then he was the one that shared it on with me. So I sort of just try to reference it as well as I can. Um, now, this is one that I've found our, our more literate kids really like this one. It gives them a really good target of how to add a bit more grunt into the feedback they're giving to each other. But the one that I probably use more often would actually be Rosebud Thorn. Um, 
Now, rosebud thorn is something that I got off um, Lisa Palmieri in the in the States. She's got a lovely little two-minute um, YouTube video that, it, that explains it in depth as well. Later today, I will actually put this presentation and a couple of these links that I've talked about up onto the ULearn site, but as I knew I was going to end up still playing around adding things this morning, I didn't bother putting it up. Um, so roses, the things that are good, like what's the positive stuff that you can say about this? Um, the buds, the, um, you know, what's the things with potential, the opportunities here that lie in there, and what's the thorns? What's the things that are really bad? Now kids are really good at the roses and the thorns, but the powerful quality feedback is actually that middle one. That's the one that can often really transform what's going on with something. Um, now, often I will use this with um, post-its, and so I'll use the different colored post-its so that kids can walk around, they can see what each other's done, write the feedback on the post-it and slap it on there, and then at the end they've got a nice big pile of all these colorful post-its. And the colors help to remember of what that one is supposed to be about. So to me, the color prompts are really important. I get really annoyed. It's just a little thing when I see, when I see other people at school using Rosebud Thorn and they've got the colors mixed up. And I'm like, no, there's real, you know. But um, it's, it's there. We've found our kids love using this for feedback. And at times we'll kind of revisit it and we'll work out what are some of the prompts that, you know, that you, what are some of the sentence starters you might use for feedback on this just to help sum them out. But often just those colors are enough for them to remember this is the really good stuff, this is the okay stuff, you know, but, and, but, and, or the things that aren't going, you know, that are gonna stop it from really, really working, but also that stuff of these are the bits that actually really need the tweak, or hey, did you think about using, yeah. If you're going to skip over that. Um, now, rubrics. Now, in Hattie's stuff on feedback, he actually talks about um, explicit rubrics being part of feedback. That it, you know, that it sits in there with that because you're giving, you know, what it is is that's the specific things that the students have to be able to do. So actually, that's part of it. Now, rubrics are something that I have fought against that I have a really unhappy relationship with. Um, until recently, I'm getting far better at using them because we use solo rubrics quite a bit at um, at school, and I quite like solo for the for the fact that it's about that thinking level and it's quite straightforward and I, I get it so I can help explain it to kids a bit better. Um, but I still have that uneasy relationship where at times I feel it kind of constrains the possibilities a little bit. Um, but we're also working on the idea of possibly developing a little bit further of you know, what does communication look like from like level three of the curriculum where you know, many of our kids come into high school, right up to like a, you know, a really great year 13 student, what should communication look like? So we've got that long term rubric rather than just one for this, you know, for this term. And um, if any of you have seen the stuff that happens at Stonefields, I'm gonna pick on Sarah again. Um, it is just incredible some of the some of the things that they've done there with helping their students out in terms of the, right, this is what I'm able to do in terms of my reading or in terms of my numeracy, what's my next step that I need to be able to do with this? You know, that really gives students that ownership of, right, I know what I'm doing, I know what my next step is. Um, touched a little bit on this this morning. In, the, in Grant's keynote, deeper learning is a movement that's really coming up big time in the States at the moment. Um, and it's about, yes, we need the knowledge stuff, but actually we need that dispositional stuff alongside. And that's the stuff that really helps to give students ownership. We need to, we need to know enough to be able to apply that knowledge, but actually we've got to have those dispositions to be able to use that knowledge effectively as well. Um, 
I think it's as simple as deeperlearning.com. <laughs> There's all kinds of stuff out there at the moment. It's a big movement of a whole bunch of schools around the state starting to get together and starting to really work on this. And it correlates really well with what we've been working on at Hobsonville Point in terms of kids knowing really well our 10 Hobsonville habits that go alongside the, you know, the other stuff that they're learning to the point that it's even on the stairs in the middle of our foyer of those dispositions. So I've really talked a lot today. Sorry, I do this from time to time. I quite like talking. Um, it's been a great example of how not to be agentic. Um, but this image actually comes from a guerrilla geography video from Dan Raven Allison. And I just love this. Because to me, this you know, kind of control panel is the way that I see we can operate within classes, within our teaching. That you know, we've got all these different things that we can loosen up a little bit of control on this, or we can hand over a bit of agency on this part, or actually this is the part that I need to really take care of. And for each of us, that control panel is going to be slightly different. So what I would really like you to think about to kind of finish this session off, you know, we've, we've looked at all these different ideas today. But it's about thinking what your next step is. So, Great, we all come to conferences and we get all these good ideas. Well, hopefully you've got some good ideas over the last hour and a bit. Um, but now I'd just like you to take a couple of minutes and just think, what's the thing that I'm going to do next term that is going to increase the ownership or agency for my students? Or in the case of Mel that has no students next term next year. <laughs> um, you know, what are the things that you're going to do to, in, to help students develop ownership over their learning? And whether it's that you sketch it out or whether you write something down, I would like you to at least do something that allows you to share it with other people. So whether it's you write it in a tweet and you tweet out, this is what I'm going to do to increase ownership of learning for my students next term, or you draw a little diagram or you write it down and just talk about it with the person beside you. So that you're actually committing to something. By sharing it, you're committing, saying, yeah, actually, I am going to take a step to change something. That's what I would like you just to do now to finish off.